in progress. Okay, so let me just uh, remind a little bit the organization of the talk so far. So after introducing the very uh, basic of the uh, motivation of the talk, uh, we were focusing on the non-commutative uh, aspect of this Wigner matrices ensemble, okay? Proving what is called the convergence in non-commutative distribution. But showing this, I decided to use a method which is specific to uh, what I developed, which is this traffic stuff with graph. It is not mandatory to prove anything that I mentioned so far, like this equation where I compute phi of x times a monomial and I have this decomposition. This formula is known since uh, 50 years in physics. This is called the Schwinger Dyson equation or loop equation. This is just why, one way to use the formalism. Okay, uh, that's it. So I will uh, state a second assumption, which is more specific to the traffic setting. Okay, and then I, I will develop something very specific to these bad ensembles of matrices for which the traffic gives a solution where the non commutative, the classical non commutative probability theory is not uh, uh, fitted to, to, to work. So, what I want, I invite you to, to consider. So, first, I will use this notation for two matrices A and B. With a little cycle like this, I define the entry-wise product of the matrices, also known as the Adamar or sure product. And what I propose to do is to compute the limit of the expectation of the normalized trace. This is our job today of the Adamar product of two polynomials in Wigner matrices. I have P of xn, entrywise product of q of xn, where the xn, they are independent uh, Wigner matrices, and we computed the traffic distribution of this guy, p, q, are polynomials, non-commutative polynomials. And what I propose to show is that for this Wigner ensemble, we have something um, quite uh, uh, surprising, is that this Adamar product is irrelevant in the following sense, that this guy is in the large n limit up to a small error equals to the expectation of the normal stress of the first polynomial times the expectation of the normal stress of the second polynomial. So of course, it is in the large n limit, which means that uh, there is a small error. So somehow this uh, Adamar product split the expectation of the normal trace. And you know, you have a normalization was over n, which shows up on the right hand side because we have two one over n, just one over n. So something is happening. Okay. So when we have this situation, I will say today, shortly, that the Adamar product is irrelevant. And actually, this property will be important in traffic probability theory. Let's see why this is true. Let's prove this using the double tree result. So let me call phi n of uh, E Adamar product Q the shortcut for this expression. Phi n is the expectation of the normal trace. I'm just re not repeating the Wigner matrices. What we must do first, if we want to use a traffic setting, is to interpret this quantity in terms of a trace of a test graph. This is a strategy in this theory. So how do we do that? We have this toe n, huh? this is just uh, like the trace, but for this combinatorial object, which are graphs. And what is the test graph that I will obtain? First, I will consider um, PQ, but they are monomials. I will assume they are monomials because this is for monomials that I made my computation. M, uh, N, uh, oh. <laughs> P, okay. So this is two arbitrary monomials in my Wigner matrices. I will represent this quantity for this polynomial thanks to the following graph. I'm start drawing, as usual, my cycle for Q. So let's say it is a monomial of length three. I have uh, X M1, X M2, X M3. 
And now I will do the same for P, but the first vertex, which is attached to the end of my first age, I will identify the one of the cycle and the one of the cycle of P. So let's say uh, we have a length six monomial. Here, I will have X L1, X L2, and so on. Everyone can check by definition of this Cohen uh, functional that this expression coincides with what we will obtain if you expand this in terms of the entries of the matrices. Okay, this is an exercise. So we have the limit of the traffic distribution, which means that we know that this guy converged and we have a way to compute this limit. What is this way? Is to expand the trace in terms of the injective trace. Just think that we want to compute a, a spatial quantity and we have a transform where the computation is much better. So every time we go to this domain, we do the computation and we come back. Let's do that. We know that this guy is a sum over the partition of the vertex set of my graphs, and I have vertices here, vertices here, of the injective trace of the quotient graph obtained by making the identification. And that asymptotically, this injective trace is the indicator of double trees. T pi is a double tree. A double tree where uh, twin edges are associated to a same matrix. I will not repeat this, but plus small error. Okay, where T is this graph and T pi denotes every graph you obtain by identifying the vertices. So the question is, what, how can we obtain a double tree from this graph? Alors, here I have uh, someone with an uh, odd, uh, odd lens, so I will get zero. So let me just rectify this. So just think about it. If I give you uh, some uh, craft material where you can just fold things with hands, what will be the, the manner to get a double tree? It's almost in the proof, as in the proof uh, we have seen earlier. The unique, way to, the unique ways to get a double tree is to first form a double tree here and then form another double tree here. And this operation of finding a partition pi one here and pi two here are independent. If you choose pi one here, there is no restriction about your pi two, which means that to get a double tree, you need to first, as before, choose a pi one in what we call V P, which is this vertex set to find P2 in VQ, which is this vertex set, okay? And the pi you're considering here will be obtained by combining the blocks, of course, uh, because this vertex may be identified on the right and on the left, but it doesn't change that these partitions are independent. And now, having that T pi is a double tree is equivalent, and it must be proved properly, not just an observation, but that's so a TP, the graph like this, when you quotient it by pi one, it is a double tree. TP, pi one, and the same holds for the right uh, hand side uh, graph. Okay, so it's as before, but we have more time, so let me do the, so plus a small error, let's do the uh, step where we just explicitly write it as a product. Double tree times the sum over pi two of the same thing, but for the other graph. And note that we have this uh, product, yeah? Uh, This product? No, no, no. It's the entry-wise product of the matrices. So this is a matrix. And this is another matrix. You, you check for a monomial. You write explicitly in terms of the entries. You use the formula for the entries of a product on this term. The formula for the entries of the product on this term. You deduce a formula for the entry-wise product of this term and so on for this trace. You just do step-by-step step all these elementary operations. Okay, okay. And uh, so what are the vertices? 
Again? The, 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 the vertex is it's a. No. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You, you have vertices for this uh, monomial as we did before. Yeah. Think about the same graph on the right hand side, but just check that when you're doing the entrywise, the trace of the entrywise product is just one over n, the sum of. And here you have the same index. And because you have the same index, the rule to make this translation means this is the same vertex here. Yes. Okay, if it was a question, it is exact. No, it was not. So if you want, I can write just a little bit more. If I consider the trace of x square on three y's product s to the to the yeah to the third, let's do that. So I use this formula, it's one over n the sum over i, and i is my central vertex of my x square on 3y1, my x third on 3y1. And now I expand the definition of what is the entry 1 1 of x square. It's a sum over one index. And for x3, it's a sum over two indices. Let's write explicitly. We have the 1 over n and the sum over i. We have also a sum over an index that I call j here, two indices that I call k and l from one to n. For this guy, we have x, uh, j, x, j, a times x, a, k, x, k, x, l, a. Right? This is an elementary uh, operation, right? And the addition of this sentence, it is represented to the graph. This formula, so it's not each of these elements, it's this big formula with its sum. You recognize the definition of the trace, just to change a, bit, a little bit the language, because in this definition, we were considering a map phi from the vertex set to n, but this labeling of the vertices is nothing else than this labeling with the convention that a is here, and then you. So the picture doesn't match, but you see uh, the idea. And I add a product over the edges, which is just this product. So there is a little cost in understanding this uh, translation, huh? but. Okay, can you, like, for example, this x squared times x to the third, uh -huh. the graph is the triangle and the x. 70. Yeah, let's finish this. Absolutely. Very good. But well, we are considering Hermitian matrices. Okay. If they are real Hermitian, it doesn't. Uh, it's not important. If they are complex, it's not being uh, relevant. But uh, let's don't. Uh, I'm not focusing on this uh, aspect. Okay. So did we finish the proof? Or <laughs> okay. Just one last step. We have seen since the computation that there are some multiplicativity. And the last step is here to recognize from what we did earlier that the sum over the partition of the indicator of uh, being a double tree, this is a trace. It was our first lemma. So we, ha we have somehow to, to reinterpret the combinatorial formula we have to go back to a trace formula. And this from the what, what we, we start for. So, so this is a consequence of our computation. This is the limit of what we announce. The expectation of the normalized trace of the first monomial P times the expected the limit of the expectation of one over n, the trace of Q. Moreover, you have a, a factorization property that says that. You can also consider the expectation of the product. If you prefer, you won't make a big error. This is specific to Wigner matrices, but okay. So just to, to play a little bit with this formalism and to go further outside the 
field of polynomials and see that for other operations, we indeed get something that works for computation. Here, it is a, a un, uh, not relevant situation, but being not relevant is relevant from the point of view of uh, traffic probability. If you know that, you have information about your matrix models, actually. If you have these properties, you actually belong to the field of Voiculescu. You will never really need traffic probability because if you have traffic independence, this property ensures that you have free independence. So you don't care about traffic. But if tomorrow you met an example, uh, a matrix model for which you compute that and you find that this is not true, you, you, this matrix you're considering won't be free with an arbitrary uh, independent matrix in general. But it is likely to be free over the diagonal or traffic independent. So gi this gives you a criterion to see if you need me or not, more or less. Okay. So if it is, uh, please. Oh, for the Adamar product? I don't think so, but people really didn't care. I, it was not known for everyone. I don't know if some isolated people just uh, already uh, solved this problem. I'm not sure, but it was not really natural to consider this Adamar product uh, before having this traffic uh, probability. So, so I never heard about such a result before. Okay. Okay, so now we have finished this part with these basic aspects, which were not uh, so basics, but basics in the sense that we were talking about these uh, uh, classical ensembles of free probability. The things are synthetically free. Yeah. By linearity. And the formalism I introduced, it has a disadvantage, this uh, graph stuff that it, 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 it talk about monomials. We will see, uh, maybe certainly uh, uh, in two days, when we are doing nice linear combination, something can happen. But in general, it is a mess. But here, the problem, you prove it by, for monomials and by linearity, the lemma I stated is true. Okay? Okay, so now let's go to the second part. Yeah. Um, what should I call this section? Uh, yeah. And what about this bad example of matrices? Weird matrices. So weird, they're not so weird, but this, uh, we have chosen this terminology. And we start with permutation invariant matrices. And in the second session, we will see these variance profile matrices. What I want to show you. Is not, uh, I will not present the full theory. I just want to show you that the formalism we introduce with graphs make things very easy for these two questions of permutation invariant and variance profile. So I propose to consider A1, A2, two independent n by n matrices. And I assume that they are permutation invariant. random matrices. What I propose to do is to compute the expectation of the normalized trace of, as of a product of some A1 and some A2. And it will be the opportunity to see that the formalism of traffic shows up. So allow me to not state all the assumptions right now, and we will uh, discover during the computation what are the good assumptions that we want to consider. Sorry, I have a probably naive question there yeah. are matrices that are not rotationally invariant but permutation invariant and vice versa they're really but one ensemble is including in another if you're unitarily invariant your permutation uh, invariant yeah okay we agree. so we are developing a theory big one with this permutation in band stuff where inside we should recover the classical theory of free probability and this is what we do the traffic distribution of a unitarily invariant model will be very specific we have seen the double trees but for a unitarily invariant matrix we will not obtain any kind of traffic distribution we will get cacti 
A double tree is just a cacti where the cycles are of length two, which comes from the fact that uh, semicircular variables are only cumulants of order two, which are non zero. I'm, I'm going too far for people who don't know. But so now that we are considering this kind of models, we don't assume that we have such a specific form, and we may have form which are very wide, for which we will not get uh, asymptotic freeness because of. Uh, because we don't have these pictures. Okay, so just give an overview, let's focus on some techniques that we can understand together. So let us compute the expectation of the normalized trace of a product, and let's do as before, A L1, A uh, L N, this for uh, an integer N, and for uh, L1, Ln, which is either one, I'm just reasoning with two independent matrices to simplify the presentation. Okay, so earlier we were considering Wigner matrices like this. No, we don't have matrices which are written like uh, x over square root of n, so it will be different. But this is always true that it is a tau n of a simple cycle. This definition we have given at the beginning of uh, today's session while well, working for every every matrices okay and here we have the first matrix oh, just write the labels because we don't uh, right so we know that this is the sum so we know that we can expand this trace in terms of indices and organize indices which are equal or not and we have written this as a sum over the partition of these vertices. And here we have the injective trace of the quotient graph T pi applied to these matrices if T is this graph. So I will recall the definition of this to pi because we must focus on it to see what happened. So I have not written the definition of tau zero because it was just a repetition of the definition of tau, but it starts like this. There is an expectation that I will put by linearity inside. One over n, the sum over the vertex set of my quotient graph. And because this is a quotient graph, I encode the identification by phi. Phi, I assume that it is injective. So my partition really tells me that two different vertices have different indices in my uh, entrywise uh, formula. And then I have a product of matrix entries. For each edge, the E, I have a matrix, which is either A1 or A2. Let's call it uh, A of, L of E, just the corresponding matrix. And then we have the matrix entry. And we start with the output. We finish with input because it's a, it's a nice convention. Here is the formula. And I forget the expectation that I've written. I have written it at the beginning of the formula earlier, but no, by linearity, I can't put it right there. Okay, so it was a formula, is clear. It's a bit cryptic at the beginning, but we start uh, maybe understanding what we mean. Okay, the permutation invariance. Voilà. We assume that each matrix is permutation invariant and the matrices are independent. So that if I consider the couple of the matrices, this is a family which is permutation invariant also. And so the permutation invariance implies that this expectation is actually independent of phi. It's the same trick as before. Remember, we were taking the expectation of a product of uh, GUE matrices or Wigner matrices. And I was saying that if you change the name of my indices, you don't change the value because you have a IID random variables. But for permutation invariant matrices, this is the same story. This assumption we use for Wigner matrices is actually the permutation invariant. So this guy, let us give a name. Delta zero because it's almost the two and zero. 
on the delta zero of a graph implicitly applied to my two matrices. And it's just a, a normalization of this guy. So that this, we have n minus one. We have this number of injective maps. We know that it is n factorial over n minus cardinal of v factorial, which is about the num n to the power, the number of vertices up to zero of the falling factorial times or quantity delta n zero, which is what is it? It's just the expectation in a product of the entry of matrices, a joint moment on the random variables that appear in your entries. Okay? But here, two matrices are involved A1, A2. They are independent. And I'm considering an expectation of a product of a function of A1, a function of A2. So it splits. Delta N0 of T pi. We can write it as an expectation for my first guy, uh, so labeled one of my quantity. Let me put phi of E as a shortcut for this, times the expectation of the product over the edges labeled two of my matrices. So here it's A1 and here it's A2. So this is my independence. And in this formula, appears a phi, okay? But I say that it is independent of phi, so this is just a notation. This is not a notation, this is true for any injective map. For all phi injective, we have this equality, okay? But, um, to n, which is injective trace, is proportional to this delta. So each of these guy is actually a delta, which is proportional to a to n. And we are going to go back to some to n. Let me do that. Uh, in the previous example, we, are, we have uh, L Vigna matrices, and today at this moment, I choose I have chosen just to consider two matrices to simplify. No, 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 no. This is because it is a product of n matrices with possible repetition. L1, L2 up to Ln. Either it's one or two, just to say that my first matrix is the first or the second one, is A1 or A2. Similarly, for the second, I decide, and so on. If you want, just put colors. You have a, a color for A1, a color for A2. And in your cycle, you say that the white one has a, the first guy, and the orange one has the second guy. OK? So you just have two colors because you have two matrices. Cool. I'll we'll just clarify now. Please. Come on. No, we need that. Otherwise, this is not true. Uh, you, you should think about this. Uh, if you try to do that without the injective trace, just splitting things like this, it won't work. So I, I, I um, we should focus on which step. But okay, we have fifteen minutes. I would like to to explain carefully the rest of the proof. So. I want to interpret this product. This is similarly, this is similar to this delta n zero, but it's not on all edges, but all, uh, just the edges label one. So I have this graph. I look at the quotient of this, so it can be quite uh, arbitrary. Let's say we have, uh, I, I will draw something which is not really a quotient of a cycle, but for today, I don't care. You can start with something different. So imagine this is a T pi. Let me uh, do something which is a quotient of a cycle. It's not difficult. OK, so if you do a quotient of a cycle with a uh, good number of edges, you may obtain this guy. So I will denote T1 and as well T2. So the graph, the subgraph of T, uh, so T pi, I should say. I am talking about this quotient um, consisting in age 
labeled either one or two, respectively. So that, I have a subgraph which is white, a subgraph which is uh, uh, orange. T1 pi is a disconnected graph like this, and T2 pi is this disconnected graph, right? Okay, so this guy is just, if I follow this definition, a delta n0 of my graph T1 pi in my first matrix. Let's write it explicitly today uh, at this moment because it's relevant. And this guy is a delta n0 of T2 pi. Okay, it's a lot of notations, but what is important is that we split stuff. And that this delta n0 can be written in terms of a tau n0 because from the beginning, we know that a, a tau zero is just normalizing differently a delta n0. So now this guy, I can write it by putting this guy on the other side as a, uh, I will normalize it a little bit differently. So let me uh, write things. Uh, Earlier, we were considering connected graph, graphs. So now that we have unconnected graphs, I will uh, write tau n0 of t1 pi. I will just incorporate this uh, non-connectedness in the definition by dividing by n chi1. And here we have the expectation of the sum over phi injective of the product as usual. The same formula as before. Just, I just want to redefine my two and zero and the graph as K connected component like this. Same for two. So K1, so Ki is the number of connected, connected components of Ti pi. Okay, and then I have the same formula. I have the same phenomenon of uh, that one delta is a rescaling of, the, of one tau. And so this expression, this guy, when you pi is uh, one over n, n to the number of vertices up to the small error plus V pi. Now, I reverse my delta zero in terms of tau. So this guy is a tau n zero of T1. I will do the same for T2. But now I have some uh, exponent which appears here. I have a n to the K1 plus K2 uh, minus two times the cardinality of V pi. I'm just using the same uh, formula as here, but no, it's not minus one, it's minus the number of connected components. So this minus one plus V with the other sign becomes the K1 minus V. I do that for T1, I do that for T2. Okay, so this is just the same trick as before, but reversed. The assumption will be that this guy converges. And this is actually the convergence in traffic distribution. It is equivalent to, there are several ways to characterize the traffic distribution convergence. This is one way, thanks to this uh, injective trace. If you look at the monograph about this subject, there is another assumption of factorization of connected components. But for the talk of this week, we don't need that. So if you discovered that in the paper, don't be surprised. It's, uh, it's some um, ingredients we want in the speech of the paper, but we don't need for the result we state. So we assume that it converges. In particular, it is bounded. And we are in the same situation as for the Wigner matrices, where we have an injective trace we want to compute, which is equal to n to some power times something bounded. Let Let's look at this power, call it eta of pi. 
And what I'm going to do is to prove that for a graph that I introduce and it's well chosen, this guy is minus one, minus E plus V, where G pi is a graph which is connected and I'm going to introduce. And the difficulty of this technique is to see which graph we will introduce that will rule this, uh, um, this quantity by its Euler characteristic. Let's call it Euler characteristic today. So after, uh, after studying this problem, we arrive to this conclusion. We set the graph that we call the graph of colored components. The vertex set is the set of um, connected components of T1 and T2 with the union of the vertices of T pi. This is an arbitrary choice, but that will work at the end because we just uh, sit in front of the problem and analyze it. And what is the set of H? But each uh, vertex is attached, attached to the components it belongs to. Let's illustrate this to be clear that uh, we know what we are talking about. Earlier, we, are, we had this graph. So we have four connected components. I will represent them by uh, some squares like this with the color that explicit uh, a little bit what is it. Now I repeat my vertices. On this vertex, it belongs to this connected component and to this one. So I draw a line here and a line here and so on. This guy belongs to this one and to this one. Okay, so let's check what is the cardinal of the vertex set. It's the number of connected components of my graphs plus the number of vertices. What is my number of edges? For each vertex, it belongs both to a, a, one, a first and a second connected component. So it's two times the vertex set. And if there is no mistake, the miracle happen. This is indeed the Euler characteristic of this graph. Okay? The minus one is the number of connected components of my graph. It is connected by definition. Check this. And here you have a, a cardinal V minus a cardinal V, which explains the change of sight. No? Yeah. Plus V minus two. Okay? So it's a bit uh, magic like this. But this is the analysis by traffic is to find a good way to interpret this power N expansion. And one way which is um, convenient is to introduce a graph where we have this quantity. For Wigner matrices, we have seen that we have a Euler characteristic on something else about the multiplicity of this H. So also this, it can happen. From some matrix model, it is more complicated and we need a much finer analysis. If we, we can assume something more natural than this and we have to work more, but still, there is a step where you introduce a good graph. And this needs some uh, intuition, of course, but uh, that's it. So the conclusion is that tau n zero of a t pi converts to zero if, let's call this guy GCC, or graph of cognitive component, if my GCC of t pi is not a tree like this, this guy is not a tree, so it won't work. But if I consider, uh, okay, imagine you make something else which is a tree, it will work. Okay. And otherwise, it converts to the injective trace, 
of the first graph times uh, so two times the injective trace of the second graph. And that's it. We proved what we decided to call after this proof the asymptotic traffic independence of the two matrices. This is a weird formula. It is very combinatorial because we have decided to write it in terms of the injective trace. And there are other characterization of uh, traffic independence, one which is similar to uh, freeness, one which is similar to the cumulant characterization of freeness. But I told you this guy in the injective trace is another transform, is the wavelet transform between the two guys. It has a sparse representation because most of the time you get zero. And otherwise, we had something which is a product. You won't expect something much simpler than a product, of course, in such a formula. Okay. So this is the end of uh, this session, if I'm right, if I'm correct. And we will see in the uh, next lecture how to interpret this combinatorial formula, which may be not very convenient. It is nice to get it, but how to work with that by proving freeness over the diagonal. We define this, and it will be much more algebraic than this combinatorial uh, aspect. This is just a detour, a bit obscure, but at the end, we want something more analytic or more algebraic. OK, thank you. Questions? If you have a matrix with IID entries, in particular, uh, it will be permutation invariant for a real matrix. So it works. I decided uh, to, do, to do the Wigner matrices where you have a symmetry, but if you try to do the same proof without the symmetry, the double trees which shows up and some these are some details that change but they are exactly the details that i i did not mention so the main story will be the same on the double trees rules the limit so symmetry we don't really care they are semicircular variable or circular variable they actually belong to the same family and nothing different happens uh, when below uh, a sketch uh, uh, the number of vertices is equal to the number of the heights, or not? So you mean that you are uh, you are trying to fix the number of vertices and h equal to each of it uh, over there? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think you want this number to match. You want this to be zero. So yeah, there is this minus one. Uh, it will be equation use the number of vertices. Yes. Uh, this is the number of vertices uh, over, of the GCC. So over. Yeah. Yeah, this is the number of vertices. But you know, it involves different uh, topological property of my graphs, the number of vertices, but also this number of connected components that can be translated in very uh, elementary uh, uh, functional of another graph. And this, uh, uh, the double tree theorem, uh, uh, what is the advantage of uh, using this uh, double tree uh, uh, algorithm or theorem? Uh, is it helpful to uh, does it, is it help us to decrease the cost of the computation? Uh, so we, if you think about the computation with a computer, this is not really the subject here. It is about the theoretical aspect mm -hmm. first. If you want computation with a computer, it will be in next uh, lecture when we will sum up this in an analytic thing. Secondly, if we introduce this setting, it's not to focus on Wigner matrices and double trees. It's clearly to, to be able to catch other ensembles. And catching other ensembles means that we don't uh, expect a priori here to have a limit, which is a double tree, a cactus, or something specific. We just assume the limit, the limit exists. Then if you specify, for an example, like the Bernoulli matrices, you will see that they are not the double trees, but trees with arbitrary multiplicity, fat trees, I call it. And so, you will play with this formula to understand what is uh, non-commutative or qualitative properties. But it's not finished. You have to understand, depending on the traffic distribution, which is basically a combinatorial uh, description, to use a combinatorial formula and to expect that you have some uh, analytical result or something like this. So 
it is a good start. It is good to have this conceptual notion of independence, which go for outside the unitary invariant model, but this permutation model. But when you accomplish this, uh, it's not done. If you want to, to draw a density, we are very far from doing this at this step. This go back to uh, 2011. Uh, and being able to do a computer with uh, a computation with a computer was uh, five years later. But you will have a, a short uh, uh, a description, a brief description uh, Thursday about this. Okay. Thank you.